I am a, as you can see here, I'm a writer. I'm a communication skills trainer and intercultural skills trainer. I wrote the book Successful International Communication. Uh, some of you know me because of the blogging I did um, from 2012 to 2019. I was um, ETP's resident blogger. Uh, I also write a lot for the British Council uh, and several other um, publications. Uh, I am also an ELT conference speaker, so some of you might have seen me at ITAFL, at B conferences at on online conferences like this one um, I hold a Delta uh, and a master's in applied linguistics so that's me um, thank you very much for your patience I'm sorry but my session is coming on a bit late today so um, if you don't mind hanging out with me for a little bit longer brilliant fantastic um, today my session is about images and working with images uh, Samuel Richardson said where words are restrained the eyes talk a great deal. And, you know, all of us know um, how a picture can speak a thousand words. So without um, more talking, let's just dive straight in. I've got nearly 100 pictures to show you today. <laughs> so let's get cracking. Now, one of the first things I often do when I get an ELT um, class is I start to pack my little box of tricks and inside my little box of tricks I have marker pens, acetate paper, uh, poster paper, cardboard cards, flashcards, that sort of thing. I'm sure many of you have little boxes of tricks too but in my box of tricks I always pack an envelope full of my own photographs. Here's one. Well, if you're wondering who this baby is that you see on the slide in front of you, that is me. Um, <laughs> that is me when I was um, a baby. Uh, I was born in Singapore, so this is me in Singapore in a cot, um, looking a bit like a boy, some people say. My grandmother was convinced that I was going to be a boy before I was born, so um, she was a little bit disappointed that I turned out to be a girl. Um, so she kept giving me these boy-like haircuts. Um, so, photo of me as a baby, language points. Any ideas? What would I be using this photo for in the classroom? How might I use a photo of me as a baby in the classroom? Ideas in the chat field. Yeah, perhaps to introduce myself, talking about past tenses, childhood memories, feelings, past simple. Um, yes, absolutely. To describe changes. Yes, I've used it to teach used to, would, um, especially with used to. Yes, someone said used to. Um, colors, interesting, yes. Photos had a very different kind of color back then. Gender bias, fantastic. Yes, controversial topics like gender bias. Family roots, all right. Here's another photo. And this one is also something I kept in my little box of tricks. So there's a photo of my family. Um, that's me in front of the birthday cake, celebrating my third birthday. Um, you can see my grandfather, my grandmother, um, the two children in front of the cake are my cousins. Uh, and then the woman smiling widely at the camera is my mother and the man holding my hand, that's my father. Some of you are already giving ideas on what we could use this photo for. Celebrations, family, cultural differences. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Someone said my mom's gorgeous, that's fantastic. Relationships. Relative clauses, has anyone tried relative clauses? The woman who is standing to my right, or to my left, is my mother. The man who is in a brown shirt is my father. So relative clauses, physical descriptions, clothing, memories. I'm an only child, so no, not a big family, unfortunately. Now let's move on to the next picture. And that's me when I was in my 20s. So while you're at it, I know, Muhammad. <laughs> Definitely used to. Yes, I use this a lot with used to. I used to have no hair. <laughs> yes, I was very bold. Um, I shaved my head 
Um, and students often ask me when they see this photo, they have the same reactions as you do right now. What? You know, why did you do that? You know, and they're really, really curious about it. Um, and I talk to them about why I shaved my hair. Um, the reason being I was looking for inner self-confidence. Uh, and by shaving my hair off, um, I was trying to get rid of the external things that we depend on for confidence in order to find confidence from inside. Um, and that often results in a very interesting conversation with my students about confidence and um, where we place our confidence. You know, some people place their confidence in their looks and appearance. Some people place their confidence in the things they own, the material things that they have, like the mobile phones, their cars, their houses, the clothes, the brands. So we talk, we, we talk a lot about confidence and material possessions um, as a result of this picture. Now, you've seen um, beauty standards, lovely, thank you very much, Mariana, the, this idea of um, beauty, what that means to us, how beauty standards are different in different cultures, um, etc. In my little box of tricks, I have this envelope, and you've just seen three of the photographs I have in the envelope. In my envelope, I usually keep about 10 to 15 photographs of myself, at different ages, my baby photos, my uh, primary school photos, my secondary school, teenage years, 20s. I shuffle them all up and then I get students to put them in order. So as a massive class for the task, I scatter the photos all around my class and I get students to put them in chronological order. And to hilarious results, because very often they think that certain photos look younger than others um, when in fact it's not necessarily true. So I get a laugh out of them putting the photos in order. They get a laugh because they feel that they're getting to know me better. Putting photos of their teacher in order is much more motivating than putting photos of some random person they've never seen before in order, wouldn't you say? This also is a great way of breaking the ice and showing them that I'm willing to bring the personal into the classroom and to personalize that lesson. And that kind of breaks down those barriers so that when I ask them to bring in their photos or to bring in something personal of theirs, they're much more willing to do so. They're much more willing to share um, because I've built this trust, this very personal relationship with them. And all it takes is a couple of photos. So that's one thing I do with images. Now, hopefully, I'll get to show you a few other things that are some personal and some less personal in the presentation today. Now, instead of using your own personal photos, you can also consider using images you find online. Now, you've all probably already do this. Some of you have interactive whiteboards, so you might use the photos you find online and put them up as a presentation, as a PowerPoint, on your interactive whiteboards. Some of you might print it out. I know um, some colleagues who used to print out certain photos they really liked and laminate them. They, they get a color printer. Yes, Vanessa, very good. You, you look for photos for commercial reuse. Um, really important to also be thinking about copyright issues. So here are some examples. So one of the things that you can do online you can search for online easily is photos related to the most current news so to make things contemporary. One website I really like to use now, of course, the news in your country and the countries you're based in might be different. Um, but the one, because I'm based in the United Kingdom, the one I really, really enjoy using uh, is the Guardian's best photographs of the day. You can find this easily. Um, these are the photographs that the Guardian, which is a newspaper, in the UK, the Guardian has a website specially just for the photographs they use for their top news items. Now you see one of these, this, this photo was taken from I think Friday last week or was it Thursday last week? And it's one of the top news items. Can anyone tell me what's this top news item here? I can give you a straight clue. The location is the United Kingdom. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It's the flooding that's happening. I live in York, 
in the northern part of Yorkshire and flooding is quite bad where I am at the moment. Thankfully, thank God, um, I'm not affected by the flooding, but it is quite unbelievable, like you said. Now, The Guardian offers a little caption when you look at the uh, pictures. You could get students to caption the picture and then reveal. Here you go. It says, flood water surrounds Worcester city centre. Residents in Riverside properties in the area were told to leave their families, leave their homes immediately after temporary flood barriers were overwhelmed. And of course, you could use this in many different ways. You could use this to get students to relate to. You could use this as a, an opener to talking about natural disasters. You could use this as an opener to talk about um, important possessions in your family. What would you save if you had to leave your house because of flood? What items would you save? All right. Um, Ludmilla, thanks for the question. Why did I move to England? That's a very long story, so I'll tell you about it in another more personal conversation. Here's another example of photos from The Guardian's best photographs of the day. A really cute photo. We all love looking at cute animals. Um, this baby polar bear was born. I'm not sure if you are following the news. Um, yes, yeah, really cute little baby. And do you know what they named him? Does anybody, any guesses as to what they named this baby polar bear? <laughs> Snow Whitey. So what was interesting about this was they opened the naming of the polar bear to the public and they collected votes from the public as to what they should call this polar bear. And here you go. Um, as you can see here, a polar bear cub in its enclosure in Tear Garden. And after more than 20,900 name suggestions were sent in from all over the world, they went for the name Finya. I, I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it, Finya. And that is the name for this cute little baby polar bear. And of course, we could always replicate that exercise with the classroom and do a vote on what, what are the top names you think are most suitable for this baby polar bear? That's a good question, Hadis. What does it mean? I'm not quite sure. We should check it out, shouldn't we? Here's another photograph of top news of the week. Any guesses? What do you think this news might be about? Irva, you are very fast. It is about the coronavirus. Um, what is the robot doing? Thank you very much. Quite a lot of you have got it. The robot is checking the temperature, a great way of not having any human contact so that you don't pass the virus on to a healthcare professional. You use a robot instead to check the temperature of and, and to disinfect them as well. If you look at this, it says it's in Shenyang, China. The robot can check people's temperatures and not just temperatures, they can disinfect them to help reduce the risk of spreading the coronavirus. Um, obviously, you know, these. this is last week's, like Thursday's news. So this is very, very current. When you use news items with the classroom, one of the greatest benefits is that you can keep the topics and the conversations in the class really contemporary. Yes, tough topic. But you know what, Yulia? Some teachers I know really shy away from difficult topics like, you know, floods and viruses. And of course, in the news, there are also lovely topics like polar bears. Um, and in a moment, I'll show you some lovely topics from the news as well. Um, having said that, I once had a student say to me, you know, I want to be talking about things that are difficult to talk about with my friends in English. I want to talk about politics. I want to talk about, you know, things that you know, I want to talk about conflict and argument and wars and things you read about in the news. And you don't often find these difficult topics um, coming up in the classroom. And yes, students need to be exposed to such topics. Of course, teachers need to be very sensitive in how they handle these topics as well. But if done correctly, if done sensitively, this could be really useful language practice for students because the world is not just all, you know, rainbows and holidays and beaches and travel. The world is filled with good and also bad things. And I think it's really important that we prepare students 
and give them the language to speak about a variety of topics. And what better than to use the news to talk about those things. All right, happy things in the news. Where do you think this is, anyone? This is a carnival, as we can see, people dressed up really in colorful costumes. Some people say Brazil, Notting Hill, Spain. Well, great variety of answers, but no one has got it yet. It is a carnival that's taking place in Portugal. Um, and you can see children joining in a carnival that includes 15 floats. Now, I'm going to keep moving because I've got lots of carnival photos for you because apparently this week and last week is carnival season. So let's have a look. Another carnival from last week. What country is this? Thank you, Zarina. It's good to know that you use the local papers that are in English to incorporate current affairs. Okay, all right. Clowns in the UK. Okay, so let's see who has got the prediction activity right. It is Germany in Dusseldorf in Germany. The Rose Monday Carnival Parade. It definitely is carnival season. Here's another carnival that took place last week. Where is this one? Venice, Italy, Spain, Holland. Okay, quite a variety of guesses. <laughs> this is in Belgium. And the performers have masks like clowns. It's a parade. Um, and it's also a UNESCO World Heritage event. Now, I'm not going into them too deeply, but if you're doing this with students, you could get them to get online and research each of these carnivals to find out what these carnivals are about. What are the events? What's the history of the carnival? Carnival. Why are they wearing ma masks like clowns? What's the significance, etc.? Here we go, another carnival here. Last carnival, I promise. Where is this one? Okay, so the majority of you got it. It is Brazil in Rio, absolutely. This is the Rio Carnival, the very, very famous carnival in Brazil. Um, and this is a members of a particular samba school uh, performing during the Rio Carnival Parade. Um, like one of you mentioned, this is a great way of, um, of, of motivating students to research and even possibly present and do individual or group presentations in front of the class about what they find out. Offer them a range of carnivals, pick one that you find interesting, research it, present it to the class. An absolutely colorful and motivating way to add color to your class. Okay, here are some other news items that I think are interesting enough to really generate some good discussions and good vocabulary in the classroom. This took place, this, new, this is a new story from quite a few years ago. So this is not from the Guardian's uh, Photo of the Day uh, website. This is taken from a few years ago in Korea, not Japan, Korea. What do you think is the new story here? Have a think about it. Where are they? Have a look around. Where are they? And what do you think the man in the photo with the, with the phone is doing? Okay, can you see the other man actually getting onto a train? So they're in a train station. They're in a metro, a subway underground, yes. It's not a vending machine. Some of you said a new way of shopping, and that is exactly what this is. Um, this is a photo of people. Um, the new story is virtual supermarket in a subway station in Korea. Um, the, 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 the products are products from a supermarket, and uh, embedded in the products are certain codes. I believe they're like QR codes. And using the phone and the relevant app, the man is able to shop for those items using the supermarkets app, that he's able to shop for those items virtually and the items will obviously be delivered to his home. So for um, people who work a lot 
and don't have time to go to the supermarket to buy their groceries. This is a fast but yet tactile way. I know you could say, hey, you can get online onto the internet and do shopping that way. Sure. But by putting it in a train station, you've made the experience just a little bit more tactile. They feel more involved, almost like you're going to a real supermarket. A great way to market their products, for sure. And you can imagine this would, again, you know, be a great way to start a topic about shopping, internet shopping, technology, the future, and so on and so forth. Gillian, you say the CO2 footprint is high, but one could claim that, you know, this, this means that the shoppers don't actually have to go to a supermarket and therefore reducing the CO2, the carbon footprint. What's the new story here? Nice one, Pauline. Fast fashion, fashion waste. So this is definitely an environmental story going on here. Black Friday, nice one. Uh -huh, recycling. I'll tell you what this story is about. The headlines is... Do you know what happens to clothes after you return them? There's a whole range of news articles about online clothes shopping. Now, on one hand, online clothes shopping could be good for the environment because you, are, you, you don't have to go to an actual shop that's paying for electricity, that's using staff and, and water, etc. So you would think that online clothes shopping is good for the environment. However, there are news reports to suggest that people are buying the same item of clothing in five different sizes or five different colors, getting them sent to them, trying them on, and then returning four of them. So I, I get five items, I return four of them, and I keep the one that fits. It's my way of um, trying clothes on. Um, because I, I don't have a physical shop and a physical changing room. So I order five pieces of clothing, send four back. But newspaper reports have suggested that the clothes that we send back don't actually get resold. The clothes that we send back get thrown into landfill because it costs a lot less for the online retailers to throw those clothes away, then to get someone to sort through which clothing items are damaged or not damaged, which are a bit suitable for resale or not. A huge topic that we could really get students into. There's a lot of reading material online that you can use to get students doing reading practice. You can then turn it into a debate, a discussion, advantages, disadvantages of online shopping, the environment, and it can be a great... Um, starting point for a lot of discussions about the environment, just starting with a photo. A lot of you seem really, really shocked about what I've just told you. Do get online and Google what happens to, or just Google online clothes shopping returns, and you'll find lots of news articles about this. Now, moving away from using the news online, we can also use websites. Now, we know that, don't we? Um, this is something I found really interesting. It's, um, can anyone tell me what the product is? You should be able to do this very quickly. There are four websites here of the same company. Exactly, McDonald's. So there are four websites of McDonald's. Why are there four different websites? Can anyone tell me? Why are they so different? They are from different countries, absolutely. Any guesses which countries they're from? So the one on the top left, let's look at the one on the top left. What country is that from? Okay, that's from China, absolutely. The one on the top right, what country is that from? Top right, top left is China, top right, Taiwan is absolutely right. Some of you are saying Taiwan, okay. Top, uh, bottom left, what country is that? Bottom left. Have a closer look, bottom left. Well, 
no one's got it yet, but if you look closely, you will see that it is from Morocco. There are French words, but there are also Arabic words there. It's Morocco. And bottom right, where is that? Bottom right. Someone's got it and was very excited to get it with lots of exclamation marks. It is Finland. Bottom right, Finland. Now, there are people who have been doing a lot of studies into advertising and what appeals to different cultures. Let's start with the Finnish one. If you look at the Finnish McDonald website, you will notice that it is very, very simple and plain of the black background. There are not many advertising messages there, just simply the names of the products, nothing else. And people suggest that because the Finnish have a, have, have a very deep-seated deep distrust of global companies that are trying to market stuff and sell them stuff. And so to overcome this distrust of global companies, McDonald's has decided as a marketing strategy not to use marketing messages because they're not going to trust it anyways, but to simply keep it simple. If you look at the Chinese website on the top left, on the other hand, you see that the main homepage has lots of messages going on. There is discounts, there are celebrities, there are QR codes, there are menus. And this has to do with, some people believe, the Chinese way of multitasking, um, the ability to multitask and look at many things at the same time, that appeals to the Chinese market and therefore their website is structured in that way. If you get your students to get onto um, corporate.mcdonalds.com, you will find a whole list of McDonald's links for all the websites around the world. You can enjoy clicking through them. McDonald's in Peru, McDonald's in Singapore, McDonald's in Hong Kong, etc., etc. Et get those websites out and examine them. What are the differences and why? Again, there are lots of articles online that you can find that actually breaks down the marketing messages behind these websites and how this relates to the culture and the thinking of the different cultures. Absolutely fascinating. I do this with my business English classes, but I also do this with my general English classes because this is so interesting. It takes the concept of culture and it goes beyond just talking about festivals, food, costumes, weddings, and we are bringing culture into um, looking at the way we see the world, the perspectives that different cultures take on the same thing. I think that makes culture a lot more interesting. Of course, you could also use infographics. Now, some of you might already be using infographics and there are so much out there. There is, there is so much out there. Um, Farah, you wanted the link to the various websites of McDonald's. Um, there will be a link sent to you in two days that gives you access to all the slides of today's presenters. So if you look at my slides at the bottom of that slide, you will see a link to the McDonald's page, okay? And if you can't wait, you can just Google corporate McDonald's, McDonald's around the world, and that should get you to that website. I love this infographic, it's really cute. I love my cup of tea. And, um, you know, in England, we drink tea all the time. I have six cups of tea a day. I put milk in my tea. Some people around Europe say, oh, that is awful. You don't put milk in tea. Like Rosinta saying, I love my tea black. Why do you put milk in your tea? Um, there are so many different ways of making tea. And I love having a, this fun discussion with students just based on tea. And there are infographics, not just about tea, but practically on anything. This infographic looks at economics in a really fun way. It looks at how much avocado on toast, seen as a millennial popular treat for millennials. If you gave up avocado on toast, how many years would it take you to afford a deposit? A really nice way to introduce the concept of conditionals, but keeping it real. None of that, you know, if you won a million pounds, what would you do? But keeping it real, you know, if you lived in Mexico City, how many years would it take you 
to save up for a deposit on a house. So infographics in the news allows us, yes, nine years. Thank you. Spot on, Vanessa. Well done. <laughs> or if you gave up Starbucks, you could find an infographic about Starbucks, I'm sure. Um, wonderful way of presenting a dry topic like economics in a fun way and allowing students to talk about it because, hey, I teach adults and I sometimes think that just because they have a low level of English, it doesn't mean that they are not clever enough for clever concepts. Just because my student is an, a pre-intermediate student doesn't mean that I have to take really simple concepts into the classroom. We can still talk about economics. We can still talk about politics in the classroom for pre-intermediate students. If you have the right images, the right infographics to accompany it, it would make that discussion a lot easier. I had a student once who was a marketing expert and in a class presentation, he talked all about color and the importance of color in marketing. He talked about how the top fast food restaurants tend to use a combination of yellow, orange and red to market those products to us because yellow, orange and red makes us hungry. So if you are on a diet and you don't want to get fat, don't design your kitchen with yellow, orange or red or you'll be hungry all the time. Now, this is this is the wallpaper in my kitchen and it's red. So I'm hungry all the time. I'm always snacking. Absolutely terrible thing to do. Um, this is a great thing that we could use with students to talk about emotions on a basic level, emotions, feelings, motivations. We can use this to talk about brands, logos marketing, or we could simply use this to talk about interior design and, you know, knowing that these colors mean these, how would you design your house? You know, you have an office in your house, what color will you paint the walls? You need to be creative in your office, you need to have peace in your office, what colors would your wallpaper look like? Yes, you can talk about so many topics just with this infographic alone. So if you're not exploring infographics, do explore them. And if you do it already, why not get students to make your own infographics? Here are some websites that you can use to get students to create their own infographics for free. They're really easy to use. Students just have to get on there. Templates are available. You just take a template, insert information, voila, you get an infographic, do a gallery in the classroom, put up all the different students created infographic on the wall, walk around the class, comment on each other's infographic. Fantastic. After infographics, I got to talk about, talk about comics. Here's a comic I've used, but all I've done is I've blanked out using PowerPoint. I've blanked out the dialogue. So, Without look, looking at the dialogue, can you give me a title for this comic strip? What do you think the title might be? What might the title be? All right, um, just to kind of remind you, we are running a bit over time, so I'll be going on for another 20 minutes. If you can stay with me for another 20 minutes to the end of this presentation, I would really appreciate that. Okay, some people talk about future schools, the evolution of schools changing. Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to show you something, and let's see if you change your mind. Okay, so you now can see some of the dialogue can you fill in the last the, the dialogue in the last square what is the teacher saying in the last square oh very good can i use the mobile can i record your voice can i borrow your phone my homework is on my phone. Fantastic. I left my phone at home. Can I borrow yours? You're all really, really close. This is what it says.
Okay. So knowing the dialogue, now can you give me the title of this comic strip? What is the title of this comic strip? Okay, Vanessa, borrowing, you've kind of got the theme of that. <laughs> the good past, how I miss it, Katagina, is that what you're thinking? <laughs> Schools never change. Oh, Isabella, spot on. Isabella's got it. Can I ask you a favor? Is what she said. The title of this is actually, can I borrow a... And I know what you're thinking. You teachers, I know exactly what you're thinking. Polite requests. Great way to start teaching polite requests there. Would you do me a favor? Can you? Can you lend me a... Can I borrow a... Etc. So that's something I enjoy doing with comics. I block things out. I get people to guess and predict what is being said in each part of the comic, comic strip. You get students to write the dialogue. Guess the title, like what you did. Reorder the story. Get the comic strip. Cut it out. Get them to reorder it or reorder the dialogue. Draw the last frame so you hide that last frame and get students to draw it in. Or if you want something really challenging, show them the first frame, get them to draw the rest of it. Information gap, something that some of you might already do. Uh -huh. You give student A one comic strip, you give student B a similar but slightly different comic strip. You get them to sit back to back and tell each other what they have and try and find the differences, compare and contrast those differences without looking at the pictures. So. I've got a picture, you've got a picture. I'm not allowed to look at yours. You're not allowed to look at mine. That's an information gap or also known as a jigsaw. You can get them to discuss the characters, the issues, who is this man? What is the problem he's having? What is his history? Yes, Julian, it's like manga. Or simply get them to make a comic strip. Now you're thinking, make a comic strip? That sounds really difficult. No, it isn't. Not if you use these websites. Have a look at these websites because honestly, it makes comics, comic strip making so easy. You get pre-prepared characters that you can just drag and drop. You can have speech bubbles that you can just fill in. Really simple way of making a comic strip. So do check out these websites. Some of them have more of a range than others. Some of them are a bit more complex than others. So play around with them all and see what works for your students. Now, I can't talk about visual images without talking about art, because art is a huge part of visual images. And now, with all the access we have to the internet, we can get, we can get access to copies and, and, and pictures of famous art so, so easily. This is, yes, Edward Munch, absolutely, the scream. Now, what else can I do with this painting in the classroom? So you know the painting, you're familiar with it. What else can I do with it? Oksana, yes, you can absolutely have the slides for presentation. In two days, you will receive a link in your email inbox to all the slides of today's presentation. So you just click on the link and you can get all the slides. So don't worry about it. So, knowing that this is the Scream, we can start to talk about the popular culture and the influence that the Scream has on popular culture and how it's been recreated. Let's have a look at how the Scream has influenced popular culture. Familiar with that one? Home Alone? Or Mario? Or Luigi, if you, if you, if you, are, if you are fussy? <laughs> Sesame Street, The Simpsons, and there's even an emoji based on the scream. Isn't that fantastic? That a simple painting could have such influence uh, on popular culture. Again, as you can imagine, we can do compare and contrast. We can, we, we can do jigsaw reading information gaps with this. We can simply get students to describe it. We can get students to find other examples of parodies of this very same painting. 
we can talk about the popular culture that is depicted in all these paintings. Oh, the feelings, yes, the feelings. Do you know this one? Hopper. Yes, Edward Hopper. Some of you know it very well. It's, uh, it's actually called Night Hawks by Edward Hopper. It's quite a famous painting. And partly it's famous for being parodied. And you'll see why in a moment. Now, before I talk about the parodies of Nighthawks, Claudio, I'm really pleased to hear that it's one of your favorite paintings. One thing you could do with students with this painting, or to be honest, any painting that features people is to get them to talk about a character. So let's have a look at the character whose back is facing well, the viewer. I want to say the camera, but this is not a photograph. The person who, whose back we can see. Who is he? What's his story? Many of you are saying lonely, so you get an emotion from there. Um, get students to write a story based on this character. Absolutely. Give, tell, tell me a story. What's his history? Why is he there? Who is he? Well, of course, you don't have to choose that character. You can choose the lady. You can choose the man who's next to the lady. You can choose the person serving them. If you find story writing a bit tough because your students are of a slightly lower level, get them to find a matching song. English songs are very popular with students. Get them to find a song that matches the mood of this story. Can you find a matching song? I can I can think of one immediately. Do you know the singer Tom Waits? When I saw this, um, Tom Waits has a song called um, something like I Will Not Fall In Love With You. It's a love song and it's all about a man looking at a woman at the bar. Um, he's never met her before um, and he's telling himself that she would never fall in love with him. I hope that I don't fall in love with you. Thank you, Pauline, you are fantastic. That is the title of the song. I hope that I don't fall in love with you. Check the lyrics of that song out and think about this painting. It kind of really matches. Can your students think of a song that matches the painting? Thank you, Julian. <laughs> we could do a spot the difference made much more exciting if it's an information gap. Student A, hold a painting, or hold one painting. Student A, hold the other painting back to back. Tell each other about the painting you see and spot the difference. I'm sure you know the people in the painting below. Of course, you can talk about the parodies. What parodies are these? Star Wars, absolutely. Uh, the Simpsons, we see that again. Simpsons has always got the pal, you know, it, it always got it right with popular culture. Um, and then we've got this one with the animals on it, a party. You know, not quite Toy Story. I think they just, I'm not, I, I don't know the characters, do you? Now, we don't have to use photos we find on the internet because, hey, most of our students have smartphones. And if they, if you allow them to use smartphones in class or if they have it, use images from their camera. Now, here's a fun one I love doing. What's this? Yeah, but it's a coil, but what is it though? So this is what people call macro photography. They take a camera and they zoom right in to something that you know very well, and you get people to guess what it is. I'll tell you what it is, it's a it's a guitar. It's, it's a part of the guitar. It's fantastic, isn't it? I'll show you another one. This is amazing. What's this? It's part of the pepper. It's the seeds of the pepper zoomed right in. Isn't that amazing? Now, I've got my own version of that. I've done my own version with the rubbish camera on my phone. I've taken this photo and I've asked my students, what's that? <laughs> what is that? 
Shall we zoom out a little bit so that you can see what it is? Let me zoom out a little bit for you, okay? This is it zoomed out. What is it? It is Kit Kat. And did you know that Kit Kat was, was born? It originated in York, which is where I live. Kit Kat is from York. And I find this a great way of introducing York to my students. How about this one? What is that? Amir, you're very good. Indeed, this is the power button on my MacBook. It is a power button indeed. So look, you can get students to do exactly the same thing. Do a model for them, show them how you do it, and then tell them to use their phones, walk around the classroom or just the area outside the classroom and take some photos, some really close up macro photography photos bring it back to their groups and get them to guess yes or no questions. Okay, so I'm allowed 20 questions, yes or no. Um, is it in the classroom? Yes. Is it on the floor? No. Oh, is it on the ceiling? Yes. Oh, um, is it white? Is it made of metal? Is it made of plastic? Yes. Get them to ask questions to try and guess what the item is. So much fun. So how can we use our students' cameras? If you're interested in this topic, I wrote a blog post on this. So if you just Google my name, Cheers Wan Chong, comma, using students' cameras or using cameras on students' phones, you will find a blog post that I have written with all these ideas. Now, you could use it for show and tell. Bring in a photo and tell your friends all about it. 20 questions, like I mentioned. Is it on the ceiling? Is it made of metal? Is it made of plastic? You could use it for compare and contrast. I'll pull up a photo of my family. You pull up a photo of your family. Let's compare and contrast. I love this one, metaphors, using the camera for metaphors, right? You tell your student as homework today, go home and take a photo of something that you feel represents peace or happiness or problems in society today. Pick a topic, give them the phone, tell them as homework, they have to take a photo, they bring it in the next day and they have to present to the class or to their partner and say why they've chosen to take this particular photo. Analyze this, sorry, the spelling mistake is there, I noticed that now. <laughs> um, bring. Take a photo of an advertisement, a poster, get them to analyze it. What are the marketing messages? Find, do it as a matching exercise. Um, you know, here are, all, here are the different photos from the different phones. Which photo do you think belongs to which student? Let's match it up. How to photos. How do you tie a tie? How do you put up a tent? Simple how-to videos, but instead of videos, you take how-to photos, six photographs to show you how to do something. Of course, we've got images and photos in our course books. So we, you know, we don't even need to go onto the internet to find those images. This is from Language Hub Pre-Intermediate. I love this photo because it says so much. What do you think the women are saying to each other? That's something I could ask my students. Or I might ask them, what caption might you give this photo? Or I might even ask them, what quote can you find that would be suitable for this photo? A nice quote that might be suitable for this photo. Now, on this page, this is a unit opener of Language Hub Pre-Intermediate. And the quote we have here is from Christian Mockinson. And it's, home is not where you live, but where they understand you. Oh, isn't that sweet? Julian, you're a little bit cynical there. Huh? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. <laughs> and then over here, we've got a really sweet one about home. <laughs> Okay, over here we've got uh, another Language Hub beginner photo and we could again do the same exercise and get them to caption it. Here we have a caption, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step from Laozi. 
or another beautiful photo again from language hub but this time the beginner series and we can see that the quote here is i love this quote if you think you can do it you can so get students cover the ca caption get students to guess what the caption might be here's another one from the upper intermediate book and we have the true mystery of the world is the visible, not the invincible, in, invisible. And in this unit, there are some really interesting views of photographs. So the upper intermediate unit, we've got these different photos of famous myths. You could turn it into a quiz. Guess what myths are they? And I know I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to make you guess them. But some of you have already got it. Medusa, absolutely. Troy, okay. Absolutely, you got Simbad there, mm -hmm. and Loch Ness. Here's another one from pre-intermediate. Guess whose smiles are those? Are these? Isn't it weird that I can actually guess who these people are without even checking the answer key? Julia Roberts. Isn't it amazing how 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 unique her smile her smile is. You could get them to describe. So photos that these are different pieces of artwork used making different materials. The one that amazed me most is D. If you look at D, that's a piece of artwork made with toilet rolls. Can you believe that? Artwork made from toilet rolls. So guess or describe the artwork. What are the materials used to make these interesting artwork? Okay, here we have a, a describing one. Um, quirky homes. Describe these homes, get them to compare and contrast it to your own homes. Where would you prefer to live? And apparently um, in Language Hub, in every single unit, you've got this thing called um, Cafe Hub, where you get these really interesting photos of a little story like this one. Before students listen to the story or look at the story, get them to script it. What's happening here? What's he saying? What's he doing? You get lots of functional language in there, do a predictive activity and get them to script it before they even listen to it. I'm sorry I had to rush through all the images, but I hope you've enjoyed today's session on images. Um, here is my Twitter handle and LinkedIn um, contact. I'm also on Instagram, so do get in touch. <laughs>